talk will be about soulbound token weighted mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You have your mic. Okay, let's go. Okay. okay, waiting for the slides. Great. Okay, so hi everybody. My name is William George. Uh, so again, I am a researcher for Claros. Today I'm going to be talking about soulbound token weighting mechanisms. Where is the button to advance the thing? Um, is, it, is it this? What? Sorry for not handling this in advance. Ah, thanks. Uh, this, and then I can go back with red? Great. Okay. Uh, so this story will be a, a tale of two mechanisms. Uh, so I'm going to consider waiting mech like soulbound weighting in quadratic funding and also in Claro's juror drawing, which I'll explain both of these briefly to recap. I'll explain, I'll recap soulbound tokens for those of you who you know, maybe are less familiar with them. Uh, and then I'll delve into the sort of actual weighting discussions. Uh, so recall quadratic funding. The idea is that maybe you have some kind of public good funding program. People are uh, making contributions to some project. You have a bunch of participants. They each contribute some amount of money uh, to respectively to some project P. Uh, and then you will basically give a grant from like a matching fund. Uh, and the total amount of the grant is given by this formula. Uh, particularly like the, the second term of the formula you're subtracting off is equal to what the people put in. So the amount of total funding that people receive, including the, the, like the, the direct contributions, is the first part with the sort of square, square root and the, and the square. Uh, and to be like, that seems kind of abstract, but to be a bit more concrete, uh, the basic idea is that if you have a bunch of small contributors to a, you know, a project, uh, they should receive more of a subsidy under this mechanism than if you just have like a couple of big contributors. So here on the left, we have uh, a bunch of small contributors to some, some worthy project. It gets a subsidy. On the right, we have an equal total contribution, but this is one guy uh, who has like one big contribution, maybe just to give himself a grant. Uh, and you'll notice that the, the way the mechanism works is he gets no subsidy at all. Uh, and uh, there are like really interesting sort of geometric ways of thinking about this. Uh, I, this draws a bit from some work by Glenn Weil and his collaborators who like really delve into these mechanisms, uh, where you can think of the sort of total amount of funding the project gets as a square, uh, where the light blue on the diagonal is the stuff that people put in directly. Uh, so on the left, you imagine you have, I guess, eight people each put in one. Uh, and on the right, you have two people put in four, so the total, same amount of total of contributions. Uh, but then the white off-diagonal stuff is uh, the subsidy the project gets. So then the total square gives you the total amount of funding for the project. And you see that on, like, if you have a bunch of tiny little contributions, that you get a huge subsidy. You have a very large square. Uh, whereas if you only have a couple of blocks, like the total square is smaller because of the white space, the subsidy is smaller. Okay, so that's mechanism one, quadratic funding. The other mechanism I'm going to be talking about is uh, Claros juror drawing. So Claros is a blockchain-based dispute resolution platform. Uh, so again, this is the project that I, that I work on, so this is sort of where I come, my perspective on this. Uh, and the idea is that, like, imagine you have some kind of dispute. Maybe Alice, a small business owner, hired Bob, a freelancer, uh, to build her a website or whatever. Uh, and... Uh, Bob, Alice can put the payment to Bob into a smart contract escrow, and if Bob does a good job, Alice will just click a button, release payment. If Alice is unhappy with Bob's work, she'll click some button saying raise to a dispute. Uh, and then Claros is a crowdsourced protocol that randomly draws some collection of people from the crowd, uh, and they judge the dispute. They judge whether Bob should be paid or not. Uh, and exactly how they're incentivized to do this job is it's so relevant for this talk. Mostly I'll be talking about the random drawing process, uh, but just briefly, the idea is it's a shelling point mechanism where the uh, jurors, the voters, are supposed to think, okay, like I've read the analysis, I've read the evidence of the case, I think Alice is right, uh, and so I think that the other people will come to a similar conclusion, they'll also think Alice is right, uh, and then they're incentivized to sort of vote in a community kind of way, they're incentivized to vote with the sort of the broad community, if there's kind of a notion of appeal, so not necessarily exactly how the other people vote on the, the random draw on panel they have, but more or less just vote like the other jurors uh, to be rewarded. Uh, so this, this draws from a notion called a shelling point or a focal point that uh, was developed by Thomas Schelling, uh, who's an economist and won the Nobel Prize, uh, where the idea is that if people are trying to coordinate, they don't communicate, uh, they tend to gravitate towards special, natural, 
relevant social solutions, solutions that have some social content. Uh, so here the idea is that like people are judging the case, they think there's an honest answer, and among the, all the answers they could vote, the honest answer is kind of special, so they should vote like that. Okay, so uh, now to briefly recall what soulbound tokens are uh, before we delve into sort of the, the actual content. Uh, so the idea is basically that a soulbound token should be a non-transferable NFT. Um, so this was really uh, an idea developed in the Decentralized Society paper by Glenn Weil and his collaborators, uh, Vitalik and Pua uh, Ulhaver, uh, a few years ago, uh, with the idea that like you, so since you can't transfer this, it's kind of non-financialized in contrast to transferable NFTs, uh, and they should indicate social information about you. Uh, maybe they have some kind of credential, you've finished some online course, for example, with the TE Academy, and you get a soulbound token, they, they do that. Uh, uh, or maybe you like didn't pay back a loan in an under-collateralized DeFi protocol, and you get a negative soulbound token. Uh, and because you can't transfer these, these sort of accumulate in your wallet, like if you really are unhappy with your social profile, maybe you can just like leave that wallet and start a new with a new wallet. You know, well, you don't want to be too dystopian or black mirror with accumulated negative reputation. But if you do that, you, you like give up all of your good social soulbound tokens. Uh, so you have. Um, you have to sort of take the good with the bad, and you develop a social reputation over time. Uh, so how are these soulbound tokens attributed? So they can be attributed by amenity. So you finish the TE Academy course, and they give you a soulbound token. It appears in your wallet. Uh, another idea is maybe you could submit yourself to a curated list. Uh, so with Kleros, we have a variety of curated lists that are arbitrated by Kleros in the sense that whether if there's a dispute about whether something belongs on the curated list, whether it satisfies some list of criteria in order to, you know, have its place in the list, uh, then Claros makes the, the ruling on that determination. Uh, so you can imagine some user is like, okay, I want the Solidity Developer Expert Soulbound token. Uh, so I'm going to provide my, my portfolio, my past work. Uh, I'm going to submit myself to the list. I provide a deposit. And if some time passes and nobody challenges her, she, she gets her Soulbound token and she appears on the list. Uh, if uh, somebody doesn't have that expertise and they try to claim that they do, then they can be challenged, creates a dispute, the Claros protocol judges whether they belong on the list or not. Um, okay, so those are the sort of building blocks for this talk. Now, waiting by SBTs. Uh, what's the idea here? So imagine that you have some, some users, they have some SBTs, they reflect their, their social history, they completed a TE Academy course, they got a pop from, from ECC, whatever. Uh, and um, they want to contribute, for example, to a quadratic funding protocol. Uh, they want to make some contributions. You know there's in extra information about them because of the soulbound tokens. Uh, and in some sense, that kind of groups them. You, you look at them, and if you kind of squint, you're like, okay, well, the like, people with diplomas, that's one kind of group. They're kind of similar in their background. Uh, and the people with the trophies, like, they're also kind of similar. That guy at the green shirt, he also has an SB, uh, like a, a POOP, so he's a little bit different, but you know, he looks more like the person with the trophy, the other person with the trophy than the people with the diplomas. So I kind of have two groups, maybe. Uh, and then the idea that was really pioneered by, um, again, Glenn Weil and his collaborators in this Beyond Collusion Resistance paper uh, is to weight the contributions by these, by these cellbound tokens. And so then again, I, I will sort of parallel their work when we get to Claros in a minute. Uh, so you put users into groups, based on their social history. Uh, and then contributors, contributions from the same group go under the square root together in the way that individual contributions went under square roots in quadratic funding a few slides ago. Like before you wanted to um, kind of give people more weight if they were individual contributions versus having some whale contribute on quadratic funding. Uh, with the idea that like you should incentivize like lots of small contributions, uh, and now with the soulbound weighting, you're like okay, well like people who have the same soulbound tokens, they kind of look the same. They have like a monolithic point of view, and it's great if there are like lots of them making contributions. But I want to fund you know diverse points of view or, or, or something. Uh, so I'm going to take the people that have the same soulbound tokens. I'm going to put them together. Uh, I'm going to pretend they're one individual, uh, and then you do quadratic funding as follows. Uh, so with our example, we had our two groups. The, um, we basically wind up with two square roots. Uh, the, you know, and like you can compute the, the total quad quadratic funding with, with like that. Okay. Uh, and back to 
this square point of view, uh, which has sort of like interesting geometry that you can analyze. Uh, so you can break it into pieces uh, based on the different groups, the different contributors. Uh, and you can look and see, OK, like I have a column for group I, I have a row, like a, a row for group I, I have a column for group J. Uh, the pieces on the diagonal, again, represent what they actually contributed. Uh, and then everything else is the subsidy. Uh, so you wind up with questions about like, okay, like if I have people that are coordinating with each other, colluding, how much can they manipulate the subsidy they're getting? Can they make the sort of white squares, in this case, the sort of pale red squares, bigger uh, in a way that's you know, extracting too much subsidy relative to the, the contribution they're making? Um, okay. Uh, and then just concretely, a mechanism that Glenwell and his collaborators consider is something they call the cluster match, where this is a sort of simple way of doing this grouping. You basically consider how many soulbound tokens a participant has, and you split them into as many, that many groups. Uh, if they have TGA, SBTs, it, basically it's as if they made a contribution of their total contribution divided by TGA to each of the groups. Uh, and then that gives you this formula for the, uh, for the total sub fund funding for a project. Uh, which, you know, explicit example of that. Uh, and now moving to Claros, like, you can do something very similar. And it's interesting how much of this idea carries over. Uh, so in Claros v1, how are people drawn to, to, to judge disputes? Well, there's a token they stake, there's a Claros token. Uh, and then they're drawn in like a direct linear percentage uh, relation to, to the percentage of tokens they've staked. And this, when Claros was launched in 2019, or the, the current version of the Claros protocol was launched in 2019, uh, was the, you know, the only real tool available to sort of make the resistance resi resist to Sybil attacks, uh, who people who would try to like get extra drawing weight by splitting up their tokens or something. Uh, so here, if you have 15 total tokens staked, I think, uh, the woman at the top staked five, so she has a third chance of being drawn on any given draw. Uh, and this is a very simple security model that in order to prevent like a participant or a colluding group from having more than 50% of the, the weight, the, the votes in given cases, if you have like a big panel of jurors, you've drawn a big, well, a large number of jurors for a given case, is um, as long as they don't have 50% of the stake, they, they won't have 50% of the vote by the law of large numbers if you have a big panel. Okay, uh, that's the same slide. Uh, so now for weighting by SBTs, you can do something very similar to the cluster match uh, where you can re-weight the stakes based on what SBTs people have because now we have this new social technology. Uh, so you can think, again, of like a participant J as having staked before it was contributed to a quadratic funding program, now it's, you stake. Uh, um, CJ, that's their stake, divided by the number of cell bond tokens they have. Uh, and then their odds of being drawn, well, it should be the, like their reweighted stake divided by the total reweighted stake. What's the total reweighted stake? Well, I can think like each participant like has sort of stakes to each um, soul bound tokens as such. I can sum them up inside the square root there to get the like kind of total amount that was staked on a soul bound token. Uh, square root that and then take the sum over all of the groups. Uh, and if, then you can decompose that in this scary formula way, I'm sorry, uh, into uh, basically a contribution by person. Uh, so the thing at the bottom is the amount of sort of reweighted stake for an individual. You divide that by the total reweighted stake, and that gives you the chances of a, of a given person to be drawn. Uh, so you can do that as follows, an explicit example, same sort of contributions I think we had before. Again, the guy with the green shirt has two subbound tokens. So now it's like his, um, his stake is divided in two, two different groups. Uh, and if you look at his weight, pretty much because he has like this group that he's the entire stake of, he gets a bit of extra weight uh, because he has a diverse point of view. Uh, and when you look at the geometry, the kinds of attack resistance analysis in terms of these square diagrams that while it all did, uh, it's interesting how it's similar but different in the perspective of Claros, where the, uh, the decomposition you do of the square, now you decompose it, you can decompose it into like an honest piece and a dishonest piece. Uh, you could have done that before, but particularly when you're considering the attack resistance of the system, it's no longer a question of like the attacker trying to make the square bigger like to extract extra subsidies. Now the question is, can the attacker get 50% of the draws on a given, on a given case? Uh, and that is equivalent, you can see, if uh, they have a bigger attacker square than the honest square. 
uh, where, again, still the, the sort of colored squares on the, on the diagonal are what people staked before it was the sort of contributions, now it's their stakes. And the off-diagonal stuff, well, for quadratic funding, it was the subsidy. There aren't subsidies here. Uh, instead, it's sort of the extra weight that you give to people based on having good soulbound tokens. Uh, so now the question is if I can like manipulate the, the squares if, as like the attacker to come up with a big attacker square by having the right soulbound tokens to get this sort of extra weighting. Uh, and then attacker model of basically you're secure unless the attacker both has a large number of staking tokens and the right collection of SPTs. Uh, so it's interesting, you have this sort of hybrid security model, if you, if you did something like this, uh, where if your mechanism to distribute the SPTs is secure, then like you're, you're more secure than the Claros 1.0 drawing mechanism. But even if it breaks, uh, and like maybe an attacker can come up with some fake soulbound tokens, somehow get them into the mechanism, uh, then that, should, that reduces your staking attack threshold, but you ideally show that it doesn't reduce it too much. So you still have economic security in addition to the sort of social security. Uh, and so, like, there's an attack resistance, like, sort of motivation to do this, but there's also, of course, just sort of like a social motivation. Uh, you know, there's a lot of social science research that shows that if you have groups of problem solvers, uh, that groups of diverse problem solvers can outperform sort of uh, groups of similar people that are trying to solve the same problem, and they're all individually high performing, but they have the same kind of background. So here, if you're like giving extra weight to try to draw people that have you know different points of view, uh, get you know, extra sort of credentials, extra sort of relevant expertise to, to judge a given case, that can produce better decisions. And like, as a dispute resolution platform, you're, you, you want that. Okay. Uh, so in my remaining couple minutes, I guess, uh, I'm just going to like, try to like delve into sort of the interesting like points of common and differences between the quadratic funding subbound and waiting, Claro subbound and waiting, and particularly this question of how you group people. Uh, so with the cluster match, which is what we've sort of been doing before, where we think of people as being equally sp split over the different soulbound tokens they have, uh, that isn't the smartest grouping algorithm. Uh, it misses a lot of information. So if you could imagine, for example, that you could have a soulbound token for the ECC POOP main event, and then people might also have a soulbound token for some side event, like, like some, some other POOP. Uh, and that's probably pretty correlated. You probably have both. If you, if you, at, least, you, know, if you at least go to the side event, you probably also have the main event thing. Uh, so that extra soulbound token didn't give that much more information. Uh, and um, you might ask, OK, like, can I have like, a better grouping algorithm? And of course, you know, in the like AI world of traditional Web two applications, like clustering algorithms are a big thing uh, that live in, in in many sort of you know online applications. Uh, maybe I could use one of those. I could use some modern clustering algorithm. Uh, so, for example, you could use spectral clustering. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I'm probably close to running out of time. But basically, you'd form some kind of matrix of the what soulbound tokens different pe people have. Uh, you do some linear algebra. You create something called the graph Laplacian. You can look at its eigenvectors, and it turns out if like you actually split people into like distinct groups, uh, disjoint groups, then the eigenvectors read that directly off. And even if you don't exactly split people into like the disjoint groups, like the eigenvectors mostly tell you what groups people are in. Uh, and so you could use this sort of more advanced clustering algorithm. Uh, and then the question is like, by using something sophisticated, like a more sophisticated algorithm, does that create a tax surface? Uh, you know, if I try to like implement an AI protocol into a directly into a smart contract, is that a good idea or not? Uh, and it, it depends. Uh, you might worry that like if you have this thing that's you know ultimately being trained on data that interact, like uh, users can interact with in a malicious way. That you could have like data poisoning problems where you someone can corrupt the spectral clustering algorithm uh, in a way that maybe the, the simpler, dumber cluster match like couldn't you know was too dumb to be corrupted by. Uh, so I've done a lot of research recently to analyze different attacks on different clustering algorithms. Uh, you can do things where like you ask questions like okay like what happens if the attacker gives themselves a bunch of fake soulbound tokens. Uh, you might also try to give fake soulbound tokens to others, try to collapse their groups uh, so that like they had distinct groups before and now, now they don't. Now they're sort of grouped together and I'm by myself as the attacker. Um, 
you know, is like, it's sort of, we've done simulations, and it seems that the thing where you try to give other people fake cell bound tokens to collapse through group is less effective than just giving yourself cell bound tokens. Uh, so maybe, you know, you come up with some kind of theorem that say, like, the best attack, at least in some clustering algorithm, is that, and you can calibrate the security of your system for, like, this worst case attack. Uh, but anyway, just to wrap up, there are interesting similarities and differences between sub on token weighting for different mechanisms, uh, quadratic funding and juror drawing in particular. Uh, you can imagine maybe applying this in a governance mechanism that probably looks more like the juror drawing, uh, but I would be very interested in um, whether if someone do tries this for some different mechanism, whether it sort of generalizes what we've already had for these, these two points of view, or whether it has like even more different sort of like different things that like are, are related by different interesting ways. Uh, so why would you, like what kind of melt mechanisms might this relevant be, be relevant for, just as a philosophical point to end on? Uh, so both of these mechanisms, quadratic funding and, and clarosphere drawing, they have something economic about them. Uh, people are either making contributions or they're staking a token. There's a notion of economic security. But there's also a notion of social information. There's relevant social information. So as you try to put those things together, maybe, maybe a waiting mechanism like this can make sense. Uh, and, um, you know, again, you know, like which other mechanisms could it be, could it be good for? And so if you're working on things where you think these ideas could fit into your work, I'd be very happy to sort of talk and collaborate and share ideas. Thank you. Thank you, William. <laughs> Thanks for this talk. Great inspiration also for us at the Academy and our NFT system. We continue immediately with the next talk, but make sure to catch William in case you're interested to discuss. And also, I just wanted to remind